evening, everyone who are in Europe. And um, also good morning to someone if, if you are joining from the US or somewhere else. So with a great pleasure, we are happy to welcome Andre to join from Boston to our winter term sleeper lecture. Um, Andre Zevsuk is an associate professor at MIT, Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Um, before joining the MIT, Andre was an associate professor at Harvard GSD. He's also the director of City Form Lab. The work Andre and his team has been done um, is trying to bridge the urban design with spatial analysis and advanced urban technology. Andre has collaborated with a number of city governments, international organizations, planning practices, and developers on urban designs, planning, and politics in both developed and rapidly developing urban environments. Most recently, in the US, Indonesia, Estonia, and Singapore. As you can see, the projects that has been done at the City Form Lab on their website, they have been working on topics such as um, the Talent Harbor Master Plan, future of, future of Streets in Los Angeles, and Urban Fabrics in Singapore. So part of the workflow under created is called the Urban Network Analysis Toolbox. I think maybe he, he'll also talk more about this in tonight's lecture. So the toolbox um, is currently used by researchers and practitioners around the world to model pedestrian flows around city streets and to study coordinated land use and, and transportation developed among um, among the networks. So um, Andre has also talked and e exhibited worldwide, including the, the TED, the World Cities Summit, and the Venice Biennale. I would also say recently, last year, at the Shenzhen Biennale. So without further ado, let's welcome Andre Sefsuk for the lecture. Thank you, Kaio. Good evening, everyone uh, who is in Europe and um, others online. Um, thank you for the uh, kind invitation. I'm excited to um, speak um, for a school in Vienna, and I'm uh, bummed that we can't do this in person um, uh, out in Vienna. So I hope we'll have another opportunity uh, when this pandemic is over. I'm going to try to share my screen with you. Um, Maybe Kaiho, you could show me a thumbs up if it seems to be working. Okay, great. Um, the topic of my talk today is integrating urban analytics and design. In particular, I will try to discuss how the spatial configuration, that is the geometry of the environment that we design at the urban scale, creates certain implications for social processes, behaviors, and activities that take place in the city, and thereby influences the outcomes of human activity in the urban context. And I'll be speaking about how we've been trying in the City Form Lab um, to analyze and understand some of these dynamics between environmental geometry and human behavior um, and processes in the urban context. I will start by referencing a famous chapter written by Sir Leslie Martin uh, in 1972 uh, that was titled The Grid as a Generator. And the reason why I start with this is because this chapter was a response to Jane Jacobs. You might recall that in her famous book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, Jane Jacobs produced a serious critique of architects, urban designers, and urban planners of her era, arguing that they missed the attention that she had perceived on the social processes that take place in cities most directly in her own neighborhood of uh, west side of uh, lower Manhattan in Greenwich Village where she lived and argued that whenever planners and architects intervened 
it worked against rather than for the social life of cities that they their projects their works um, undid or damaged the complex reality um, of uh, urban life that she was so keen to observe and this was a fundamental critique that reverberated throughout the entire discipline at the time it was a serious um, milestone um, and and a, a mile about what urban design what architecture and planning are really doing when leslie martin wrote this piece he famously argued that it was in fact in some ways the spatial structure of manhattan the famous grid of commissioners designed in 1811 that gave rise to the very dynamics that jane jacobs loved so much that what she called the sidewalk ballet that took place in front of her house and on the stoop of the staircases in the Greenwich Village of the time, et cetera, was in fact partly generated by the density of Manhattan and in particular, the geometric configuration of the Manhattan grid that put so many people in close proximity with each other to generate such social life and the differences it had on the avenues versus on the streets, et cetera. Other thinkers have called this capability of urban design to relate to the social space or social life between buildings as the charged voids. For instance, Allison and Peter Smithson have written that architecture, the charged void describes architecture's capacity to charge the space around it with energy, which can join up with other energies that can define the nature of things that might come, anticipate happenings, a capacity we can feel and act on, but cannot necessarily describe or record. So while I very much agree with the sentiment of Allison and Peter Smithson, I would like to take you one step further and argue that we can indeed understand and record some of these dynamics, that it's not only something we can feel uh, but we can indeed analyze and understand how the environment we design produces those impacts uh, for social life between buildings. I also refer to a study, um, an early study by Louis Kahn in the 1950s uh, when he lived in Philadelphia. By the way, as a side note, Louis Kahn is another Estonian <laughs> from uh, the island of Saarema, but left fairly early. Um, where, where Louis Kahn studied the flows of uh, the Philadelphia grid, um, which he referred to as rivers, but there were vehicular flows, there were pedestrian flows, there were public transit flows that the grid or the environmental geometry of the city uh, really generated and articulated. So in my work, in order to even begin to make sense in analytical terms of these relationships between the environmental geometry and um, the flows that take place in the city, I oftentimes model and represent cities as spatial networks. This can be done at cross scales. We can represent buildings as spatial networks. And there's a whole tradition of doing that that goes back to the 1960s when graph theory was really spatialized. Uh, but in my own work, it more typically happens at the urban scale, at the scale of the street, at the scale of a district, or at the scale of the entire metropolitan area. And why it's so important to me to be able to work with spatial networks is it because it brings a whole analytic capability to understanding um, how space, how spatial phenomena are related to each other computationally. Bringing this representational framework of a network to urban spaces allows us to apply computational techniques to analyze them that are otherwise prohibit prohibitively difficult to do with just our eyes or our minds looking at maps and plans. So how would we do this? And this is one example of taking a fairly complicated place. This happens to be um, the, a piece of Singapore uh, in an area called Bugis, where there is Sultan's Mosque and, and streets like Haji Lake. It's a fairly complicated built environment where lots of stores, lots of visitors, lots of places, and even a place as complex as this can be represented as a spatial network. 
typically to do that, we represent all places one could walk, whether they're sidewalks or crosswalks or alleyways or even publicly accessible corridors within buildings as network segments that connect to each other. And then the origins and destinations of movement, whether they are building entrances or even individual rooms or places within buildings uh, become dots that are loaded with attributes. So these are origin, origin destination data at a very high resolution. They can be three dimensional, not just in plan view as shown here. And to facilitate such analysis, I'll give you one example of how one would go about modeling spatial flows over networks. So imagine you have just a single origin and a single destination with 100 people at the origin. The simplest thing one can do is to think about, well, what is the logical or the simplest path between these two destinations? And we could obviously route those trips over networks. So we'd, we'd assign 100 people to each of these shortest path segments. But this is not necessarily how people actually behave. In real cities, people don't necessarily take shortest paths. They oftentimes deviate to nicer paths or better paths, or there's a certain amount of discretion that's very hard to predict. So in, in some ways, uh, people probabilistically distribute over paths that are not that much longer than the shortest path, but there's many, many options. So here's a more realistic view of how such trips may be distributed from an origin to a destination with only one of each. Uh, across all possible paths that are at their disposal, in this case, all paths that are up to a certain percent longer than the shortest, 10% in this case. And instead of assuming that all 100 people undertake this journey, we can analyze how far the origin destination are from each other along the network and apply certain probabilities that we can gauge from the real world, from really analyzing how people move in the city. And in this instance, the 100 number has dropped down to 75 due to the distance cost um, involved. So we're basically saying that out of 100 people, only 75% of them uh, may be willing to make this walk because of the distance cost involved. Now, that's simple and easy enough if we just have one origin, one destination. But what if we have many of both and we have a fairly complex view of the built environment? Well, one of the problems we often run into is called competing destinations. So if we're trying to understand, for instance, how people may be walking from their homes to, let's say, transit stations, uh, which one do we model the trips to if there's many options available? The same problem happens if we're trying to understand how people may be going to parks or playgrounds or restaurants. There's oftentimes many competing destinations. So in this instance, we typically deploy uh, a choice model, which models probabilities of going to different destinations. And in this instance, I'm showing a single origin building and 13 different bus stops nearby. And each bus stop is given a probability for attracting the trips from this building, but they're not necessarily equal. Some bus stops can be more attractive than others if there's more service or more frequency or more bus lines coming by. In this particular example, I have given a higher attractiveness to the bus stop that is called D10. And as you can see, it attracts more of the visits. Uh, and there's basically only one trip um, or one person at the origin point, but it, this person's trips are split into tiny probabilities and split into 13 different destinations. But a greater share of those trips are headed down towards D10 because of the higher attractiveness. So this can uh, affect the probability. Now, we can make things even more realistic and complex if we include lots of different origins and lots of different destinations. So we're oftentimes not just operating with one origin, one destination, but we can operate with thousands of origins and thousands of destinations and apply such choice probabilities amongst many combinations of those. So we, when we try to do that, we have a model, a framework for trying to model flows like you saw in that Louis Kahn map of Philadelphia in real built environments amongst many different trip origins and trip destinations. So with that in mind, I would like to give you an example of how this um, has been done um, in some of the studies we've conducted. And these studies rely on the help of software to do that. And, and Kaiho already mentioned that 
my research group has been developing this software plugin called Urban Network Analysis Toolbox, which is a plugin for Rhino. It's free and available for download. Um, and there's also a, uh, an earlier version of it for, for ArcGIS. And there are um, documentations available for, for how to use it and what exactly um, the software does. Um, so I, I would like to proceed with the remainder of the talk by giving, we're walking through three real research projects that apply these sorts of methods to analyzing developed environment. And I will split them into sort of three topic areas. In the first example, I will continue what I was just discussing, which is how do we understand how the spatial configuration of a place affects the flows, the foot traffic, the pedestrian activity on different streets of an area trying to model a fairly complicated origin destination matrix of flows. In the second example, I will turn to what is called accessibility and illustrate how the spatial configuration in, in the world of urban grids affects and dictates spatial accessibility and what the outcomes or implications of that might be. And in the third example, I'm gonna to try to illustrate how spatial configurations of environments, um, and in this context, it will be the MIT campus as an example, uh, can indeed impact social networks and talk to that relationship between space and social, uh, social uh, behavior. So the first example comes from the Kendall Square um, area of uh, Cambridge, which is just an adjacent town to Boston. And it looks at how we could predict pedestrian flows um, around this area. Kendall Square is also home to the MIT campus, but it's, it's more than that. There are over 300 biotech companies. There is major other technology companies, including Google and Microsoft, who have big offices at Kendall Square. So much of the environment where this bridge called Longfellow Bridge enters onto the Cambridge side, um, much of this environment around that area is called Kendall Square. So it's a mix of academic and um, office and a little bit of residential areas. In this study, um, we first collected actual pedestrian uh, count data on different streets around Kendall Square. So this involved collecting pedestrian flow data at 60 some uh, locations um, on, on different street segments, which were sampled in such a way that we wouldn't only look at very busy streets or only very quiet streets, but it was a sampling that tried to cover as much diversity as possible uh, of different streets. And based on that sample, we built a estimated model of pedestrian flows using the techniques I referred to above. So with a fairly complicated set of origins destinations. So we have trips that go from offices to eateries. We have trips that go from train stations to offices, from homes to train stations, uh, and so on and so on. So it's a matrix of different origin destination flows. Now, how do we calibrate such a model so that we know that the flows that we predict in the model are actually describing the flows that are on the city streets? This is where these pedestrian counts or surveys come in. We use the survey data to calibrate the estimated data. And here you see some of the statistical models, but what I want you to pay attention to is which types of flows dominate in model three, which is the final model here. And what it basically tells us, the upper part of the chart talks about the evening peak period. This is the period between four to 8 p.m. in the evening. And during that period, we see that it's really the flows from workplaces and students sort of um, environments that on the MIT campus to the subway, as well as the flows from amenities to amenities that dominate. These two types of trips that are in the model explain 83% of all variation that we count on the ground. So we, we compare the estimated data to the uh, actual pedestrian activity that was measured on 63 streets of the area. 83% of that variation is explained by these two types of flows. It looks different during the lunch period in the, in the bottom of the chart, where there are three dominant flows that explain what we see on the ground. During the lunch period, it's trips from offices or workplaces to um, F&Bs, uh, these are food and beverage um, establishments like restaurants, cafes, and so forth. 
Um, second, trips between from amenities to other amenities, which is basically shops to shops or restaurants to restaurants. And third, between subway station and subway stations and amenities. These three types of trips together explain 77% of all uh, variation observed in the actual count data. Now, this produces basically a prediction model of pedestrian activity on every single street in the area. And I want to highlight that even though the model is calibrated and trained on those 63 locations where we collect real data, once it's calibrated, it can be generalized for the whole area. And so we, we produce an estimate for every single street in the area and, and have a guess during the evening peak period or during the lunch period how many pedestrians we expect walking on different street segments. Why is this useful? What can we do with it? Well, you can probably imagine um, immediate use cases for, for instance, investing public taxpayer dollars into the public space. Putting better sidewalks, better street furniture, better landscaping, better lighting, uh, and so forth, dedicating more space to places that benefit the most people. So having an idea of how pedestrian flows are distributed in the area during different times of the day could become a first step for evidence-based investment into those areas. But moreover, what we were curious to do in this particular research project was to investigate or explore what might happen to these pedestrian flows as a result of ongoing redevelopment projects that are currently in construction or in permitting in Cambridge. So this image here shows that the Kendall Square is actually a really active new development area in Greater Boston. It's um, among the highest office um, price places in all of Greater Boston. Uh, it's a sort of an R&D hub for the greater city. Um, and many new office buildings, many new lab structures, many new even apartment buildings are currently going up. It's a very active um, construction area. So we took the data from these different construction projects that are currently underway and brought them into the model. In order to investigate the before and after effect in the calibrated model, we have a model that we know explains the current foot traffic patterns fairly well. What if we in insert these current projects that are underway and investigate what happens as a result of these projects during the different times of day. And this is done on uh, along all of these locations. So all of the black um, footprints in this map are ongoing projects that are either in construction or um, uh, almost finished or, or in, have already received permitting. And this next map shows the, the predicted change in foot traffic. So it's not the absolute number of pedestrians, but it's how many additional pedestrians or less pedestrians we expect to see as a result of these projects. And the same buildings that I showed in black are now shown in red. And as you would expect uh, during, for instance, this is for the evening peak period, um, the highest footfall is expected to, um, the footfall is expected to increase the most in places where either we have the new construction project right next door or that are nearby popular destinations like the subway uh, or lots of amenities on the ground floors. So it's maybe no surprise that um, the, the biggest uh, levels are predicted right around Kendall Square subway station where we have uh, an estimate of over 3,000, 3,500 additional uh, pedestrians on the streets. Um, but in some instances, you also see negative numbers here. And what this basically says is that it's because of the redevelopment, we create new destinations for pedestrians that didn't exist before. And that will shift these probabilities for the trips that I spoke about earlier to new destinations. And that can actually produce a mild decrease in trips in some places. So even though we're not actually taking away any development, we're just adding new development, this new development can shift trip probabilities to new areas and cause a reduction in pedestrian activity on some streets, but most of these reductions are, are very minor. So by and large, we observe new levels of pedestrian activity in different parts. And in the blue lines, I also highlight here where we might expect pedestrian congestion to occur. So this is where sidewalks have enough foot traffic, and when we compare it to the dimension of the sidewalk, I'm actually using a sort of definition of congestion that was proposed by Jan Gehl from Denmark, which argues that uh, it's roughly 12 people per yard of sidewalk or meter of sidewalk per hour per direction, uh, which would um, cause enough congestion. So using that definition, 
um, there are some streets that were congested already before the redevelopment, which are the solid blue lines. And here I marked with the dashed blue lines, those streets that would actually uh, get congestion as a result of these uh, ongoing um, developments. So this can be a sort of further input in terms of how we want to treat the public realm, uh, especially the sort of pedestrian environment in places where um, uh, congestion or, or new foot traffic would occur. And to give a sense to what some of these numbers mean, we've also started compiling uh, what we call a street catalog and uh, basically shooting time-lapse videos and, and just regular videos of streets around the world. Um, you can access some of them on the lab's website. Uh, and the intent of this is to produce an intuitive output of what, for instance, a thousand people per hour on a sidewalk might mean. So this particular sidewalk here in Cambridge um, has around a thousand people per hour. When these models output predictions like three and a half thousand people per hour in addition to what's there right now, or 1,000 addition, we often don't, don't have a gut feeling or an intuition what that really means. So the purpose of this video catalog is to start actually putting a face on these numbers and, and to, to uh, get a sense of what these densities actually mean uh, for activities on city streets. So the first example was really about understanding how the spatial configuration and environment, where the origins are, where the destinations are, what the geometry of the pathways between them is, and how that combination produces a flow of humans on these network links at different times of the day, and how we can actually predict what that flow really is, validate that, and then use the model to predict what happens as a result of changing the environment. The second example, deals with accessibility and talks to how the spatial configuration of a place in, impacts access to surrounding destinations. And I'll talk about it in the context of a very kind of common urban design problem, which is deciding how big city blocks should be. And this is an interesting question that a lot of people have uh, strong opinions about. Um, Jane Jacobs herself, who I referred to at the very beginning, famously argued that the blocks of Manhattan the famous commissioner grid blocks are too long. That if they were cut in half, people would have a much more direct route to their destination. And she even did this hand sketch diagram in her book, Cutting Manhattan Blocks in Half. Leon Krier, here using Vienna as an example, has argued that urban blocks should be as small in length and width as is typologically viable. They should form as many well-defined streets and squares as possible in the form of multi-directional or horizontal pattern of urban spaces basically arguing that we should have small blocks wherever possible. And Alan Jacobs from UC Berkeley, who has studied streets around the world and published books on great streets, has argued that some of the greatest streets in the world have a cross street every 90 meters and sometimes even more frequently, um, essentially making the same argument. Indeed, also in the more engineering worlds, if we look at transportation studies, uh, urban block size is oftentimes used as a predictor of walkability with the expectation that smaller block sizes ought to correlate with higher levels of pedestrian activity. So it's almost a truism in the world of urban design as well as in transportation that small blocks should necessarily equal better working, walking environments or more pedestrian activity. And that's the question we try to um, regard in this research. If we look at the actual urban grids that have been built uh, around the world, um, they come in very many different sizes. These are all sort of original grid designs uh, in uh, new colonies in the North American and uh, Australian continents. And they vary from the very large uh, grid of Adelaide, Australia, where city blocks were designed to be over 500 meters long on the long side and 130 meters on the other all the way down to the tiny blocks of Portland, Oregon, which are only about 60 by 60 meters. Huge variation between them. Now, can we just say that the small blocks of Oregon are more walkable than Adelaide? That happens to be true, but it, I'll, I'll try to demonstrate to you that it's not necessarily the smallness of these blocks that um, uh, produces the high level of pedestrian accessibility in these cases. So in order to analyze how the size and the parameters of these grids actually impact pedestrian access to destination, which is a key prerequisite for walking, we had to implement a metric. 
And our metric was a, a simple accessibility metric that measured from every parcel in a grid, how many other destination parcels you can get to within a 15 minute walk, about a kilometer. If you extend the walk in every possible direction along the grid, um, this metric describes what's the sort of opportunity space, what's the accessibility to surrounding destinations. And this is really a key prerequisite from the literature on walkability. If you have a lot of destinations to walk to, you are much more likely uh, to make a trip and people are, have been observed to walk more frequently if they live or, or inhabit places of very high pedestrian accessibility, lots of destinations developed. So we use this metric as a kind of guide to search how grid parameters affect the um, outcome. Here I've plotted the same North American grids and Australian grids on a chart where on the y-axis vertically I show how many neighboring parcels you can actually get to within a kilometer and on the x-axis are the different grids and so the Adelaide grid I showed on the top left uh, or sorry, uh, was, is now on the, on the bottom right and in the Adelaide grid, you reach around 300 neighboring parcels within that one kilometer walk in any direction. If you take the exact same travel shed, the exact same one kilometer walk in any direction and do that in Manhattan in the original grid, you reach about 6,000 neighboring parcels. So this 20X difference between the two is unsurprisingly produced by the geometry of the grid. The parameters of the grid dictate this. And in particular, there are four parameters of traditional double-sided grids. That First, parcel frontages. Second, parcel depths. Third, street dimensions. And fourth, most interestingly, block lengths or block sizes. Okay? The impacts of the first three dimensions are not really hard to guess. You probably already guessed them. Um, how we analyze them in this particular study is that we um, wrote a program um, for, for Rhino to simulate synthetic artificial grids. Um, and we produce tens of thousands of different urban grids and in each iteration apply the same metric of accessibility to understand how that particular outcome grid will impact pedestrian access to destinations. So this enabled us to basically do a controlled experiment where you can keep everything else constant. For instance, you keep the parcel uh, sizes constant, the street dimension constant, and you only vary the length of the block with those given dimensions, and you can see what happens to the accessibility outcome. So I'll go very quickly uh, through the first three effects. So parcel frontage effect is very expected. The smaller, the better. The narrower the parcels, the more destinations you can reach, all else being the same. If you have wider parcels, you can see how basically the distance between each destination starts expanding and you don't, within the same given distance budget of one kilometer, you just can't reach as many different um, frontages. And in fact, this is the, what's called the elasticity of this effect is one to one, which means that a 1% decrease in parcel frontages corresponds exactly to a 1% increase in pedestrian access. It's a very powerful way of making urban grids more walkable is just to design them with shorter or narrower frontages and every 1% shrinkage in frontages will impact the pedestrian accessibility by 1% positively. So it's the most effective way of making grids more walkable. The second impact is also expected. So the parcel depth effect, the, the shallower the parcels, the less time you have to spend walking past the sides of the blocks. So the shallower or the less deep urban blocks are, the more destinations one can reach along the grid. And this elasticity is slightly less so. So a 1% decrease in parcel or block depths corresponds to roughly a 0.7% increase in uh, pedestrian accessibility. So it's kind of a second best strategy is to make blocks not so deep. Um, the third effect too is not hard to guess, uh, the street um, dimensions. The larger the street, the more time in your one kilometer time budget you end up crossing roads and the less time you have actually to reach the, um, the actual um, addresses or, or destinations that are in the urban plots. And this is in even lower elasticity, so roughly a 1% decrease in street dimension corresponds to only a 0.4% increase in pedestrian accessibility. So it's the third best way of you know, making um, 
block more walkable. But the most important and interesting effect is the block size effect that we came to study. Remember this truism in the urban design field that small blocks are more walkable. This is what allowed us to test that assumption. It turns out that the effect of block length, and I'm specifically saying length, not size, because if, you, if we already fixate the parcel sizes and the parcel depths, then that dictates the, the thickness of the block. Then what's remaining is the length of the block. And that's our proxy for block size, is nonlinear. So what this means is that if you're starting off with very small blocks, in fact, you can make urban grids much more walkable in terms of pedestrian accessibility by making the blocks bigger. So the curve initially goes up very steep. Uh, on the x-axis here, you see number of parcels in a block. And on the y-axis, you see basically accessibility. It's called mean max uh, maximum mean gravity. It's basically the mean uh, value of uh, accessibility from any parcel in that block. So it's not from a specific parcel, but it's averaging it out for the whole block. And at some point you reach an optimal level. And this is the, this is the maximum um, accessibility for pedestrians that that block size can provide, given that we've chosen certain parcel dimensions and street dimensions. And after that, if you make the block longer or bigger, pedestrian accessibility actually starts dropping again. If you've ever been to areas with very small city blocks like Barceloneta on the waterfront in Barcelona or even in uh, Portland, Oregon, you'll probably know this effect that even though it looks very walkable, you constantly keep crossing streets. And that's the, the problem with very, very small blocks is that you spend more time crossing streets than actually walking past uh, destinations. So we then applied this idea to this same set of grids that I showed earlier to check how close they came historically to designing a perfect block size from a pedestrian accessibility perspective, using the exact same parcel dimensions and street dimensions they had chosen. And the outcomes are somewhat expected, but also surprising. So it turns out that in Manhattan, the pedestrian accessibility is almost perfect for the given parcel size and street dimension that the Manhattan grid works with. It's 97% of the possible maximum. So in that sense, the venerable Jane Jacobs was wrong. <laughs> if you made Manhattan blocks half that size, you would actually decrease pedestrian accessibility and probably reduce walkability in the city because people would have fewer destinations within their 10 or 15 minute range available to them because they would end up using that time to cross streets rather than pass by the destinations. Um, but it's almost perfect as it is. And so it is in also Indianapolis. But if we look at some other grids, like for instance, Adelaide, Australia with that 500 meter block, it turns out that the pedestrian accessibility could be improved by almost 12% had they just chosen a different block size, even using the exact same parcel dimensions, exact same street dimensions, but just made the block a little bit longer or shorter they could have improved it by 12% uh, in, in pedestrian accessibility. So I'm giving you two concrete examples. And this is why it's important to keep in mind that the ideal block size from a pedestrian accessibility perspective depends directly on the chosen parcel dimension and street dimension. Once we fixated that, we can find what the optimal block size is, but it's different for different parcel and, and street dimensions. So in Portland, Oregon, we find that you can improve pedestrian accessibility if you make the block longer. So Portland block currently has uh, four parcels per, per frontage. If you make them 10, you could have a 9% um, improvement in pedestrian accessibility if the block was just longer in that direction. In Adelaide, the opposite is true. Pedestrian accessibility would increase by 12% if the block was far shorter. So rather than having eight parcels per frontage, if it only had three, you would have, um, you would reach 12% more destinations within the same time budget. So it's not clear whether, uh, what's the optimal size depends directly on parcel and street dimensions. So it doesn't always mean smaller is better or, or bigger is better. It really depends on what parcels we operate with. So as a final sort of test in this research, we, we performed a simulation, which is called a Monte Carlo simulation, to generate um, realistic grids. So one could kind of critique the previous story and say, well, this is kind of like a laboratory experiment where you say that you keep everything else constant and vary one parameter at a time and see the effect. Maybe that's not realistic. Maybe that's not how the real world works. 
So in this instance, we chose with the same four parameters, realistic bounds for both for all four of them and, and had the computer generate lots of different grids in realistic bounds for each of them. And so each gray dot here is a particular grid. And we've plotted on the X axis block size and on the Y axis pedestrian accessibility. And so what this shows is that by and large, intuition is true or correct that by and large, the trend is such that the bigger your blocks, the less accessibility you have. But there's this scatter in the gray dots and this, the thickness of the scatter basically shows that as you move up towards the arrow, these are all counter examples. These are all examples where having a bigger block actually means having more walkability or better pedestrian accessibility. So that truism that smaller blocks are, are better doesn't always hold. In fact, there's lots and lots and lots of different uh, counter examples where making urban blocks bigger is better for pedestrian activity. Um, and final step for this uh, was to generate some realistic grid. So if we, we say that, okay, let's fixate the parcel dimensions and the street dimension we want to work with as a developer, what would be the ideal block size for, for pedestrians given those dimensions? And so we, we did this for four different types of parcels um, on this example. And each time the, the size comes out differently because the, the ideal block size for pedestrians depends directly on these dimensions. Okay. So the third example where I would like to kind of invite you to think about how the spatial configuration of the built environment that architects, urban designers, and urban planners lay on the ground impacts social life in cities is some ongoing research we're doing on the MIT campus as we speak. And this is a really interesting study uh, because we don't have many places in the world where we have such data available. And the data we have for the MIT campus which was obtained by, from the information services of MIT is email traffic between all faculty and researchers. That was partly anonymized and identities are protected, but we know how much email traffic there is between individuals on campus and we know where the individual's offices are. Uh, and we can aggregate that up to the department level, to the school level, et cetera. So we, we use this as a proxy metric to describe how much communication occurs between different individuals. And in this research, we're analyzing how, whether and how the spatial structure and configuration of the campus has anything to do with the volume of communication, the volume of email traffic between individuals. So we're operating only a part of the campus here. This is the old historic main campus designed by Bosworth in 1913 and some of the new extensions to that. Uh, here on the right um, would be where the MIT Media Lab would be. And these are the rooms, the individual rooms on the entire campus. So in this instance, we're applying spatial network analysis in 3D to the sort of campus as a whole. Now, the email data um, is plotted here first to just indicate how much email traffic different departments generate. So maybe no surprise that the Sloan School of Management, which is basically the business school at MIT, generates the most email traffic, right? Both incoming and outgoing emails. Um, and some of the smaller uh, departments like uh, Office of the Provost, it's only a, uh, maybe a dozen people or so, uh, has, has far, far uh, fewer emails. So this depends partly on the size and, and the number of people involved. And we plot here um, the sort of full matrix of email traffic uh, between um, uh, schools. And, and as you can see on the diagonal, the values tend to be higher. This basically just indicates that there's lots of intra-department emails, that the architecture school sends emails to the architecture school. So, and, and that's to be expected, right? The inside the department, there's a lot of reason to email each other. Uh, but you also see some brighter spots amongst other departments. So, uh, for instance, the brain and cognitive science department and the biology department have a lot of email uh, traffic between them. So we came up with three uh, particular hypotheses of how space could have anything to do with this email traffic. First, we wanted to test whether the physical proximity between offices has any explanatory power to explain the volume of email traffic between two individuals. So, if we look at the network distance between two offices or any two offices, is that, does that help us explain at all the amount of email traffic between them? Two, we wanted to see whether 
not just how far offices are, but also whether the walking past other people's office on your way to work or on your way out of work might have anything to do with email volume. So basically, do people have who are more likely to walk past each other's offices when entering or exiting the campus exchange more emails with each other? So it doesn't mean that our offices are nearby. It just means that when I come off the subway or the parking garage or by bicycle station, and I happen to walk through the nuclear physics department, am I more likely to have anybody I know in the nuclear, nuclear physics department and actually exchange emails with them? And third, we wanted to see whether common access to the same list of amenities has anything to do with that, which basically means that if you have the same eateries nearby, if you both have, let's say, a Starbucks nearby or a, um, uh, a food provider nearby, and if you both go to the same destination, is there a better chance that you might have actually entered a conversation, made a connection, and that will result in some email traffic with each other? To answer or to look into whether any of these have an impact, we also need to control for a lot of intervening factors that are very important. So as I already mentioned, if people are in the same department, then obviously there's lots of email traffic in the department. So we have to have that in the model. We, we need to control for the intra-departmental email. And second, it's also expected that certain departments, because of other things than spatial proximity, have a lot more in common. For instance, computer science and math might have a lot more common uh, research and therefore that's the reason they email each other more or as i showed cognitive sciences and biology may be closer in their research and therefore email each other more so we actually include these in the model and and control for these and this is important because if we didn't control for these then we couldn't say that the spatial effect is attributable space in, in fact it could be uh, just that the happens to be that these two departments that are nearby each other are also related in research so therefore the sort of distance between them is not really what's at stake it picks up another effect so here's the answer to the two first parts of the the spatial questions that are raised does proximity between offices matter it turns out that it does and that's surprising that uh, the closer the offices are in the whole campus after controlling for which department they are in and allocating a certain effect to the intra-departmental -department, email and also the inter-department email, the, after controlling for these, the closer the offices are, the more email um, traffic uh, there is, but it's a very small effect. It explains a tiny bit of the entire variation. We have a giant data set of millions of emails or email uh, sort of numbers. And it only exp explains like less than point, uh, less than 1% of all variation, but it's statistically highly significant. So this number for negative 41, et cetera, it basically shows that it's not a random thing. It, there is a statistical correlation across all emails that the closer the offices, the more email traffic we have. And second, this chance encounters effect, which measures if I walk past certain offices on my way to my office, and the way we actually did this, if you, if you try to sort of understand the sort of model behind it, is that we looked at all of the official data of how people arrive on campus. What percentage of people take the train? What take the bus? How many bike to the campus? How many walk to the campus? How many come to the parking garages? We set this all up as a spatial network model. And from all of these entry points, from the train, the bus, the garages, we modeled probabilistic trips to offices. Uh, along the 3D network. So we produced a kind of an estimate of how likely you are to walk past a particular place uh, on your way to work. And here too, what we see is that there is a relationship that the, um, uh, if I'm more likely to walk past, uh, let's say a nuclear physics office on my way, I'm therefore also slightly more likely to have an email exchange with that office. And it's a very small effect, but again, it's statistically highly significant. These T statistics that are like 30.3 and 30.4, they are significant if it's two. We're far above that. We're, you know, the T value is 30. So it's like 15 times greater than uh, could be attributable to uh, sampling error. So these are really statistically significant effects. And that's basically interesting or exciting because it tells us that just the way the campus is spatially organized, already influences who knows who and who communicates with who. And traditionally, this data has been extremely hard to get. We don't have data about who talks to who, et cetera. There are studies that do, for instance, Facebook social networks, but those are 
you know, across the globe or across the planet, and it's really hard to pin them down to any spatial configuration. But in this case, we have a controlled experiment on one campus. We know the spatial relationships, and we know the social relationships according to the email data. And we're detecting that there is indeed a role that space plays. And as architects, you might say, well, obviously, I knew that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this profession. Like, if architecture doesn't do any of that, then who cares? But it's really hard um, historically to actually analytically show such relationships. So the third part about access to common animated is something in progress. So I probably would have an answer for this in the next couple of weeks. We're actually running this analysis. So I want to conclude um, this part with a particular a certain thoughts. So there was um, a famous paper that a sociologist called Mark Granovetter wrote in the 1970s where he argued that weak ties are really important in, in so societies. By weak ties, he meant social connections between people who don't meet very often. They meet maybe once a year, a couple of times a year. Those are people who you bump into at a coffee shop, who you meet at a conference or at a train station. And he argued that they are more important in many ways than the strong ties in the society, which are your family members or your colleagues at work that you see every day. For instance, Granovetter demonstrated that weak ties are much more likely to deliver a job to you than strong ties, that we're much more likely to find a job via a connection through somebody we meet rarely rather than who we meet every day. And also for general transmission of information through societies, weak ties are absolutely critical. Now, the question is, where do we, where do we even get those ties from? Where do weak ties start and maybe become strong ties over time? And I argue that this MIT campus experiment demonstrates that space has something to do with that. Strong ties happen in your office environment and they're predictable because you're self-selecting into these groups. You work with your colleagues or you live with your family members and there's a great deal of self-selection in that. But the built environment, whether it's in buildings or in streets or in urban neighborhoods, can produce what I call latent ties, connections that the environment probabilistically induces that can become weak ties and that over time can become even strong ties. And the built environment has a key role to play in that. And if we design environments of a certain kind, there might be no ties if they don't induce that social encounter. And in other cases, they do, they could actually become that. So I think a key missing link in this theory of social connections is the role of space, how space can create the ties that Granovetter is talking about. To conclude, I want to um, also evoke some sort of higher order questions that we're left with when we think about the relationship between spatial configuration and the urban realm. We can do these sorts of flow models that Louis Kahn was talking about in the 50s. We can do them fairly precisely. We can predict how many people are going to be on every street segment during different times of the day if we have a good data set of origins, destinations, and the, and the uh, network between them. We can construct these models on computers. But what does it tell us in terms of design? What is a better or worse flow environment? Can, is, is it better that we have a uniform flow on different streets or that we have a certain hierarchy that there are many, many more pedestrians or visitors in particular places than others? I think this question is very similar to what Kevin Lynch in his famous book on the image of the city asked. Kevin Lynch produced these show, social images, basically cognitive maps, and he did them by interviewing tens and tens of people and asking them to draw from memory, for instance, in this case, the map of Boston. And then he overlaid them on top of each other to have the sort of collective consciousness of what people think um, Boston is and, and what are the edges, the landmarks, the nodes, the neighborhoods, and so forth. Now, you can revisit Kevin Lynch's work and ask, but so what? What is a better image and a worse image? And implicitly, Lynch argued, by the way, that, that if we have a better recollection of the environment, then we identify stronger with it, and that's a better outcome. So he famously argued that, for instance, Jersey City in New Jersey had a weaker social image than Boston or even downtown Los Angeles. And, and you know, we can sort of conclude from that that having a good recollection, having a good understanding of the environment we live in is in itself a positive thing because it's part of our identity. But with these flows, 
what is a better or worse environment? And I would like to argue that environments that produce diversity of encounters, that produce more choice so that we can choose a route or a neighborhood with less encounters versus a neighborhood with more encounters, a route that's busier versus a route that's quieter, that diversity that geometry can produce in itself is an inherent value we should inspire towards as designers. And I wanna use Stan Anderson, uh, who uh, unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, who for a long time was a, a head of the architecture department at MIT and did some really interesting work on urban geometries back in the 70s and 80s. Um, he studied the grid of Savannah, Georgia, which is a famous complicated grid. Um, it's, it's famous partly because it's the, one of the most generous grids out there. If you look at the map below, every single parcel has access to at least two streets. Most of them have access to three or more streets. These kind of uh, middle parcels have even access to four streets at a time. So it's a highly ge uh, generous grid that is hard to repeat. But what he's found when studying the structure of Savannah was that this diversity embedded in the street, which in fact has uh, uh, six different types of streets, which I've named by uh, number uh, letters here. So there's a sort of the C street that goes through these uh, gardens in the middle of every uh, ward. Uh, there's the B street, which goes north and south straight, etc. There's the A street, which is double sided with parcels uh, with narrow frontages facing it. Standards and argued that this was not an accident that certain things located in the grid according to those um, spatial relationships. For instance, he argued that the, the B Street became a natural thoroughfare for cars. That's where you would find gas stations and that's where people would drive through the grid faster. The A Street, on the other hand, because it has all the narrow parcel frontages, is a perfect candidate for a shopping street where you have a high density of destinations within a short range. And that's indeed what happened in Savannah. So Stan Anderson basically wrote that the decision to parcel the private development areas in a certain way established local use patterns that transformed what might seem an arbitrary geometry into a structure filled with information. And I think that is the capability of urban geometers is to actually provide information that is not deterministic. It doesn't determine behavior, but it's probabilistic. It can generate likelihoods of things to occur, just like um, in my beginning slide, Leslie Martin called the grid as a generator. The, the generative capacity of architecture and urban design to produce these encounters and to uh, formulate relationships through geometry. Um, I'll stop there um, and be happy to take um, questions and discussion. If, yeah, thank you, Andre. I, th I think it's a lot of information and also I think the audience, they need a little bit of time to digest.